tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. This episode of Chilling Tales for Dark Nights is brought to you by Mood. 420 is on the way, guys and gals. You know what that means, don't you? It means the McSorley house will basically be turned into a giant bong. <laughs> If you can get up onto the roof, you can toke right out of the chimney. Just try not to fall off the roof, huh? What am I smoking in there? Mood, baby. Mood is the finest source of federally legal THC products on the market. They've got special blends for whatever high you're after. Chill, energized, creative, or even focused. All pesticide free from small family farms and regularly tested in third party labs. Celebrate 420 exactly how you want to with Mood. Get 20% off your first order plus a free THCA pre roll at hellomood.com with promo code CHILLING. That's hellomood, M O O D, dot com. Code CHILLING. This episode of Chilling Tales for Dark Nights is brought to you by Fume. Ever tried to break a habit and felt like you're climbing Everest in flip-flops? Yeah, we've been there too. But here's a breath of fresh air. Fume. It's not about giving up. It's about switching up. Fume takes your habit and simply makes it better, healthier, and a whole lot more enjoyable. Fume is an award-winning flavored air device designed to help you replace your bad habit with a harmless one. No vapor, no electronics, no chemicals, just natural delicious flavors. Start the year off right with the good habit by going to tryfume.com slash chilling and getting the journey pack today. Fume is giving listeners of the show 10% off when they use my code chilling to help make starting the good habit that much easier. Start the good habit at tryfume.com. That's T-R-Y-F-U-M dot com slash chilling to save 10% off the journey pack today. Good evening, listener. You're listening to Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. On tonight's edition, we invite you to leave behind your safe reality and descend with us into the frightening depths of the most terrifying imaginations with two audio adaptations of frightening fiction about wretched rooms and eerie experiences. I'm your host, Paul J. McSorley, and tonight and every other Wednesday night, I'll be your guide as we traverse the dimly lit corridors of your darkest dreams. Joining us tonight to help bring to life the frightening fiction of P.D. Williams and Tim Ritter is none other than your host of the evening, Paul J. McSorley. Now get your ticket ready, take your seat in our theater of the minds, and brace yourself. It's time to turn off the lights and turn on the dark. 
Our first tale this evening is written by P.D. Williams and performed by Paul J. McSorley. In it, we meet Kyle, a man just starting out in the petrifying profession of mortuary work. Now, without further ado, I present to you The Draining Room. Kyle rapped on the rear service door of the funeral home, hoping someone would soon come and open it. It was frigid this time of year in the Kentucky Hills, particularly at this late hour. The biting winter wind cut through his frame despite his heavy coat. Each time his bare knuckles smacked the dented metal door, an icy shock pulsed up his arm, reminding him he was within minutes of hypothermia. The wind roared, blocking out all sound beyond the door, including footsteps. It had been a good ten minutes of pounding at this point. He'd give it one more before giving up. He balled his fist, preparing to deliver a heavy hammering. Suddenly, there was a light metal clanking emanating from within the door. It's a bad time, Lyle thought. A tall, spindly man with patches of wiry brown hair and his otherwise bald head stood in the doorway. His cheeks were sallow and his skin loose on his skeletal form. The blue lab coat he wore was wrinkled and stained. With what? Lyle did not want to know. Mr. Creighton, I'm Lyle. I hope I came to the right door. Needn't have beat the door so hard, Creighton sneered. We don't move fast around here. It's not as if our clientele have anywhere to be. He pushed the door further out stepped to one side and with a dramatic flip of his hand, beckoned Lyle inside. Thank you, Lyle said, stomping snow from his frozen shoes before entering. I was beginning to think I might freeze to death out there. Well, if you had, you'd have been in the right place, the morose man said with no hint of humor. As he spoke, Lyle couldn't help but look at his teeth, or rather what remained of them. They were small and cracked with black splotches near the top from lack of care. His breath stank of stale coffee and gum disease. Creighton allowed the heavy door to slam shut, causing Lyle to jerk. You might want to toughen up, boy. Otherwise, you'll be afraid of everything else in here. The interior hallway felt like a furnace compared to the outside chill. Lyle unbuttoned his coat and slung it over his shoulder. Seeing Lyle making himself comfortable, Creighton said, That door gets opened a lot during the day and sometimes at night, so I like to keep the hallway warm. It'll be cooler in the prep room. Now, who did you say you were? I'm Lyle Blaylock. We spoke on the phone a few nights ago. I answered your ad. You hired me as an apprentice. Oh, right, right. Creighton said, nodding his head at the recollection. I recall you sounded very earnest. He walked past Lyle, waving his hand in a come-along motion. The blue shoe booties the curmudgeonly corpse handler wore slid smoothly and silently down the wide hall, creating the illusion he was floating rather than walking. Lyle nervously followed him. The place was already putting his nerves on end, his neck hairs as well. A harsh odor. Something like formaldehyde made him queasy. The hallway was eerily silent. The only sound was the slap of his damp shoes on the pale green linoleum floor. It looked older than dirt, probably the only flooring the depressing old building had ever known. He noticed some pale parallel tracks leading to a pair of swinging double doors ahead. He presumed they were from the gurneys that taxied the dead around before their journey to the earthen hole or they'd be planted like holly bushes and forgotten. Creighton continued. You said that you haven't got any experience in this field, but we're eager to learn. I like initiative. Besides, it's not as though we have a lot of qualified applicants way out here in the sticks. The ones who have come through have been few and far between. The job's not for everyone. I plan to stick around as long as you'll have me, Mr. Creighton. The funeral homes back where I'm from require a one-year college certificate just to begin an apprenticeship. 
stopping at the thick plastic doors, Graydon turned to Lyle and grinned. Lyle didn't like that grin. It was better suited for a jack-o'-lantern than a man. And inside a creepy funeral home in the shadowy portion of a one-light town, it was undeniably sinister. You hear that? Creighton whispered. Lyle swallowed hard. Hear what, sir? Exactly, Creighton said. Not a single complaint about your lack of training. But we'll take care of that right and proper. Let's start with getting you suited up. Wouldn't do to get fluids all over that nice clean shirt and those fancy pants, would it? No, sir. I'd like to avoid that at all costs. That's what I figured. Come with me. Upon entering the room beyond the doors, Creighton handed Lyle an oversized pair of surgical scrubs and pointed him to a small grungy bathroom to change. When he finished dressing, Lyle placed his street clothes on the bathroom counter and joined Creighton who was leaning over the naked body of a paunchy middle-aged man inspecting his mouth. Creighton glanced up, noticing Lyle's return, then gestured towards a wall shelf. Grab that face guard and a rubber apron. Then come over here. I want to show you something. Lyle put on the protective gear and stood opposite Creighton at the stainless steel table. Trying to calm himself, he held his breath as he had never seen a dead body up close before. He didn't want to appear overwhelmed, but despite his efforts, his vision swam and he dizzied. Creighton snickered at Lyle's reaction. He went to a noisy refrigerator, retrieved a bottle of Gatorade and brought it to Lyle. Here, take this. It'll restore some electrolytes. That is, unless you'd rather puke and pass out. Lyle gratefully took the bottle and drank half of it in one long pull. He quickly felt better. Once his embarrassment subsided, he thanked Creighton and refocused. Hoping to avoid humiliation once more, he kept his gaze low, anticipating the start of what he hoped would be the first in a series of lessons. Now listen, boy, Creighton said. When the bodies arrive, we first have to prep them. That means we remove their clothes and personal effects. Those go to the family. Then we place the deceased on his table for inspection. We have to check out all the orifices and yes, it's as unpleasant as you'd think. I like to start at the top and work my way down. I check the mouth for dentures, the nose for snot and the anal canal for waste. Once I'm finished with that, I use the hose to rinse down the table. Last, I wash the body with a mild disinfectant. Hair, too. Can you tell me what you think comes next? We have to drain the blood and clean them out for the embalming process? Creighton's macabre smile returned. That's right, that's right. Now then, look around and tell me what you see and what you don't see as far as equipment is concerned. Lyle scanned the room. He had read a lot about body prepping, so he had a good idea of what he was looking for. But this facility was so old and cheaply maintained that it lacked any of the equipment found in modern funeral homes. The only machine he saw was what appeared to be an outdated embalming pump. Its tall glass canister sat on top of a squat console that had a dial and two meters on its front. The apparatus made Lyle think of a blender. A long tube with a thick needle was attached to the bottom of the console. Lyle surveyed the rest of the room but saw no additional equipment. What was missing? Then it hit him. I see the pump for the embalming fluid. Very good. Continue, Creighton urged. What I don't see is the vacuum from removing the blood and organs. Don't you have one? Used to. Then gave out some years back. I haven't replaced it. May I ask why? Creighton sighed. In case you haven't noticed, Lyle, this is a very small operation in a very small town. There's not a lot of money to be made. Folks around here are mainly out-of-work miners, store clerks, or food servers. 
They don't have a lot of disposable income. And like most people, mainly the young, they expect to live forever. Also, funeral expenses aren't the first things that come to mind when you're trying to keep the groceries coming or your truck from being repoed. That's one reason I've had to do things the old-fashioned way. That leads us to the next room. Follow me. Lyle grabbed the half bottle of Gatorade for safety purposes and followed Creighton into an adjacent room. Ceramic tiles covered the walls, their grout stained black with gunk and neglect. The concrete floor slanted toward a drain in the center. A couple of feet underneath the ceiling, a thick steel rod ran wall to wall. From its middle hung a thick chain attached to a pulley system. A meat hook dangled at the end. Along a wall was a swath of pegboard covered with various types of knives, clamps, and other tools of butchery, including a bone saw. A wash tub lay on the floor underneath, a shelf lined with used two-liter soda bottles. Creighton strutted around the brightly lit room as if he was proud of the display. Lyle felt frozen. He surmised the horror that took place in the room. He couldn't bring himself to speak. Creighton spoke instead. This is the draining room where we empty the corpses. I know it may seem shocking to you, barbaric even, but it serves two essential functions. By keeping the cost down, folks can afford to bury their kin with dignity and respect. That's good for them and helps me to keep my business open. But it's the second function of this room that gives them so much more. Life. Creighton shuffled to Lyle, placing his bony arm around his slumped shoulders. I need you to pay attention to what I'm going to tell you. You may find it unsettling, frightening, and maybe it's best if you do. You see, out of all the equipment that I've owned... The most important are those soda bottles and that wash tub. Creighton could feel Lyle's body quaking, could hear his staccato breaths trying to escape his lungs. I, I, I don't understand, Mr. Creighton. Then I'll explain it to you. Like lots of other scary stories, this one began one bitterly cold night. Just like this one. Knock, knock, knock. Creighton was mopping up when he heard rapping on the back door. He thought it odd. He wasn't expecting any body drop-offs, and the showroom had been closed for hours. Wanting to be sure of what he had heard, he took a moment to listen. Silence. Hmm, he muttered, then went back to mopping. Knock, knock, knock. Creighton felt startled. Someone was certainly at the door. He put the mop down and entered the hallway. He hesitated. Who's there? He hollered. Whoever was at the door didn't answer. Creighton waited, uneasy. Knock, knock, knock. His apprehension gave way to annoyance. All right, all right, I'm coming. He stomped down the hall, ready to tell off the impatient visitor. When he opened the door, no one was there. He called out, but no one answered. He chalked it up to high winds, being tired or both. After closing and latching the door, he went back to finish cleaning. Creighton stopped in his tracks when he saw the man, the creature, the whatever it was, standing in the prep room leering at him. It was at least seven feet tall with a ghoulish elongated face. Its weathered skin was pale gray, the color of a granite headstone. Gnarled hands with filthy cracked claws dangled from grotesquely long arms that hung to its knees. It wore rags that reeked of dirt and rot. Its dead black eyes bore an icy hole through Creighton's soul. Working on bodies in varying degrees of trauma and decomposition had made Creighton immune to the horrid images of death. But the frightening being was different. It barely looked human, much less alive. It stared at Creighton as if it was sizing him up for a meal. You're the proprietor of this establishment, the creature growled. <laughs> That's right. How did you get in here? 
You'd be surprised what we can do. What do you want from me? I don't want anything from you. I want something from your dead. Creighton shivered. What could you possibly want from them? Their insides and their blood. Why would you want that? The terrifying creature walked within two feet of Creighton and looked down at him. Creighton was too scared to meet the thing's haunting eyes. When it spoke, its low hissing voice felt like broken glass under his skin. My kind has lived quietly in these woods for many years, sustaining ourselves by feeding on animals. You've probably stumbled upon their eviscerated remains. Folks figured that bears or wolves did that. Why are you after them? We need the nutrients contained in their blood and organs, a type similar to that of humans, but not as powerful. Consuming all of you would better fit our needs, but we don't think it wise. It would draw unwanted attention to us, which might well mean our extinction. Therefore, we take whatever the woods offer us. Until now, we've bothered no one, and no one has bothered us. We'd like to keep it that way, but our bodies demand a change. Creighton was panting from fear. What kind of change? The animals have been little more than a weak substitution. Our hunger and needs have increased. What we now require must be human. It gives us our life, our vitality. Creighton saw where this was going. Do you think that these people, though dead, can meet your needs? The thing nodded. Their harvest is weaker than that of the living, but it will sustain us better than the animals do. So if I provide you with a steady food source, you'll leave us be? Yes, but we'll need to be fed regularly. How much blood and organs do you need? One body. Every ten days will suffice. Creighton mentally crunched the numbers. He worried. You have to understand, I'm a small-town undertaker. There may be times when I'll come up short. I can't go around killing my neighbors. I wouldn't even if I could. Besides, in a town this size... Questions would be raised. The creature's malformed face hardened with thought. Then it gave Creighton a solution. So you're telling me you're providing them with human remains? Lyle asked, sickened by the idea. It's for all our sakes, Creighton said. It's up to me to try to preserve our way of life, pitiful though it is. The bodies are going to be emptied anyway, so why not use them to save my neighbors? At least that's how I square it. Lyle shook again. And that man who's laid out in the prep room? We'll bring him in here and string him up by his feet. Then we'll field dress him just as you would an elk or a deer. Blood goes in the bottles, guts go in the tub. What's left we give to the earth. We leave the creature's items at the edge of the woods and collect the empties the next day. Lyle felt weak and nauseous. I don't know if I can do this, Mr. Creighton. I understand your reasons, but there's something about using people for monster food that doesn't seem ethical. Holy... Creighton used a softer tone. Look, son, this is how it's got to be. Trust me. You'll get used to it. My other apprentices did. Like you, they couldn't afford the price of a certification course, so they came here to learn the craft and hone their skills. But they also found out what it means to serve a greater purpose. Lyle's heart overrode his mind's concerns. All right, Mr. Creighton, I'll help you. Creighton cocked his head, eyeing Lyle warily. Need to be able to count on your discretion, Lyle. You'll get a good education from me, 
but you can't tell soul what we do here. It'll cost me my business and perhaps some innocent people their lives. Understand? Lyle searched himself for the answer. I came here to learn an important skill and that's what I mean to do. I suppose that if it helps your neighbors, I can live with it. You have a deal, Mr. Creighton. Creighton slapped his hands together, rubbing his palms. Well then, young man, let's make a mortician out of you. A few weeks passed as Creighton carefully and patiently educated Lyle. Lyle was sickened at first by the visceral procedure involving the removal of innards and blood, but like the apprentices before him, he learned to treat the bodies as what they were, vacant vessels. Creighton accompanied Lyle on his first few trips to deliver the food to the creatures. Soon, Lyle thought of it as little more than delivering groceries. Per Creighton's instructions, he always returned the next day, collected the empty bottles and washed up, then took them back to the mortuary for cleaning and storage. On one such day, he found Creighton prepping a new arrival. Normally, the mortician went about his work dispassionately, but today was different. The man looked scared, worried. I'm back with the items, Mr. Creighton. I can start with cleaning, then help you with the body whenever you're ready. Without looking up, Creighton said, You're probably a bit worn out from the trip. Why don't you help yourself to Gatorade? Sure thing, sir. I don't want to lose too many electrolytes. Lyle snickered. Creighton smiled at the remark, though it appeared disingenuous. No, Lyle, we don't want that. Lyle fetched a Gatorade from the refrigerator and joined Creighton at the prepping table. He took an ample swig and tried not to burp. It seemed disrespectful. Business has slowed down quite a bit, hasn't it, Mr. Creighton? You think you'll have enough bodies to keep those things sated? As he drank more of the Gatorade, he felt a slow guilt building in his heart as he considered the callousness of the question. Unfortunately, I'll have any more customers booked in time soon, Creighton said somberly. Mr. Tiller here is the last meal I can offer for at least a few more weeks. That's not good. What do you typically do in a tight situation like this? Lyle grew groggy. His body felt rubbery, his head light. The Gatorade dropped from his hand, clattering to the floor. Same as I always do, Creighton said sadly. Hire a new apprentice. The End This episode of Chilling Tales for Dark Nights is brought to you by Mood. So, how are you celebrating your 420 this year, guys? Or as I like to call it, Mood Day. Steve Taylor and I are going to set up a big mood spread. It's kind of like a charcuterie board, but instead of meats and cheeses, it's all sorts of awesome mood products. Pre-rolls, ash, dab batter, the works... And now that I think of it, we should probably also get a charcuterie board. <laughs> Have you checked out Mood yet? They've got an amazing selection of federally legal THC products. Everything from vapes to edibles to drops to hash. All specially designed for just the feeling you're after. They've also got this incredibly potent THCA flower. All pesticide-free, third-party tested, and completely legal. I call that good, clean fun. With Mood, you're never in for a guessing game. Their in-house experts use 10 high-inducing strains to create products with predictable effects. Stuff like Delta 9 Sleepy Time Gummies when you need to get some sleep, and Tropicana Cherry Cookies Flower when you want an energized high. They've also got really unique stuff like THCA Moon Rocks. Be sure to check those out. Not to mention powerful CBD tinctures when you're just in the mood for a little relief. Whatever you're after, Mood's got something for you. You know me, guys, I like the euphoric, energized, and aroused varieties. 
I love a morning Delta 9 THC gummy and a Kush mince pre-roll at night. Talk about winding down. Throw on a little comedy, light up the Kush mints, and I feel like a million bucks. That reminds me. Don't forget my Kush mints, Steve. And the moon rocks. We're totally trying the moon rocks. Celebrate 420 exactly how you want to with mood. Get 20% off your first order, plus a free THCA pre-roll, at hellomood.com with promo code CHILLING. That's hello moodcom code CHILLING. Thanks for your support and for supporting our valuable sponsors. This episode of Chilling Tales for Dark Nights is brought to you by Fume. I remember all too well how hard it was to kick that bad habit of mine. Same one you're trying to kick right now. And if there's one thing I learned through that hellish scenario, it's that it's easier to switch habits than drop them entirely. And that's where Fume comes in. Fume is an award-winning flavored air device that lets you switch up instead of give up. And how I wish I had had one when I needed it. With a fume device, you can indulge your physical habit, but be free of the unhealthy stuff. No vapor, no electronics, no harmful chemicals. Just natural, delicious flavors and a great little device you'll love to use. You know, even having dropped the aforementioned habit in the past, I enjoy this fume device. It's surprisingly flavorful, a little like a nice herbal tea. It has lots of little features that are fun to fidget with, too. It's designed that way. You know, to keep your hands busy with the little magnets and moving parts. Good for stress. It feels good to hold, too. Real wood and nicely made. I know it's tough, my friend. But you know what? It doesn't have to be that tough. Instead of just giving up, switch it up with fume. Start the year off right with the good habit by going to tryfume.com slash chilling and getting the journey pack today. Fume is giving listeners of the show 10% off when they use my code chilling to help make starting the good habit that much easier. Start the good habit at tryfume.com slash chilling. That's T-R-Y-F-U-M dot com slash chilling to save 10% off the journey pack today. Thanks for your support and for supporting our valuable sponsors. I hope you enjoyed The Draining Room, as written by P.D. Williams and performed by Paul J. McSorley, with production and music by Justin Reynolds. Our second tale of the evening is written by Tim Ritter and performed by Paul J. McSorley. In it... We ask a question fit for the ages. Where do the most frightening monsters dwell? Under our beds or within our heads? Now, without further ado, I present to you, Mind the Leg, Madeline. Where do the most frightening monsters dwell? Under our beds? or within our heads. If you want to live to see tomorrow morning, listen to me. Two unbreakable laws govern the process of retiring for the evening. Period. Following these rules not only ensures restful sleep, attention to these nocturnal requirements absolutely, positively saves your very soul on a nightly basis. Therefore, you must listen to me. As a child, I obeyed these rules to the letter. I guess that statement is quite obvious, because had I not followed them, surely I would not be here today sharing this tale with you. And now, I find it most important, most crucial to share these guidelines, these rules, these laws with you. I do this out of care for your safety and well-being. 
The first rule, always be certain that the door to your closet is closed and latched before crawling into bed. This prevents any specters that dwell within your closet from getting out during the night, lest they attack and eat you. The second rule, never, under any circumstances, allow your arm, leg, or foot to be exposed while you sleep, and for the love of all things holy, do not let such appendages dangle loosely and carelessly over the side of the bed as you rest in quiet slumber. Otherwise, the beast under your bed could reach up and grab you, then pull you down under the bed, do terrible things to you, and ultimately eat you. I sense some scoffing, some of the doubting of Thomas as you listen to my story. But dear friend, I must tell you that I have proof of the necessity of these commandments. I am sad to say that some individuals familiar to me have not followed these rules, and as a result, they no longer walk among us. Their tales are tragic, and it pains me to think that these souls would still be alive had they heeded these simple edicts. Pertaining to the first rule, I speak of poor old Jules Cockamer, who lived on Dumain Street in the heart of the Bayou St. John region of New Orleans. Jules was what one might classify as a bit of a hermit, a loner, having been widowed many years before his demise. Superstitious to a fault, Jules lived a lifetime of trepidation, always careful to avoid the conjuring of evil spirits or the angering of the benevolent ghosts which he was convinced surrounded him within the dark and gloomy historic district in which he lived. His rickety old house, bleak and in constant need of maintenance, stood as a testimony to gloom and melancholy in a way that few structures can, and gave every appearance of spirits residing within. Most of the shutters, dingy and worn, barely clung to the clapboard siding. The frayed curtains, hanging crooked in the windows, announced to all who gazed upon the facade that the home suffered from loneliness and neglect that mirrored its occupant. Upon entering the house, guests, which were rare, experienced an instant bombardment of scents and aromas, not all of them pleasant, which appeared to attack the nasal passages and taste buds from all directions. Cloves of garlic hung at each doorframe to ward off vampires. Each room sported a different herb, placed in a variety of dirty containers adorned with cobwebs, indicating that they had not moved from their locations for any unknown amount of time. Scents of dill, lavender, oregano, and parsley mixed with the smell of mold, curtains in need of washing, and the old wooden floor covered with dust that swirled up in little whirlwinds as one walked from room to room to dismal, depressing room. The herbs keep the evil spirits at bay, monsieur. He often mumbled. If no guest was present, he mumbled it to himself. He always threw salt over his shoulder, no matter whether he spilled any or not, and always in the same manner. Granules pinched between the thumb and first two fat stubby fingers of his right hand, then tossed over his left shoulder as he muttered, Le Grace. He never walked under a ladder, lived in wretched fear every Friday the 13th, and avoided black cats at all costs. Above all, he religiously made sure his closet door was securely closed at night before retiring for bed. Never remarrying after the death of his pungent wife, he found companionship in a large gray cat, which he named Neptune. Oddly enough, the cat never vocalized in the form which we humans refer to as a meow. Neptune made no such noise ever. He purred, of that there is no doubt, but oddly, this gray cat, large and magnificent in appearance, was for all practical purposes mute. Jules and Neptune spent nearly every hour of the day together. At dawn each morning, 
Jules awakened to the familiar sensation of Neptune rubbing against his stubby whiskers. Neptune's greetings served as an alarm to which Jules awakened daily. He typically spent a moment or two rubbing the cat's ears, then both arose from the bed for a mutual breakfast. They took walks together each morning, ate lunch together, and spent the afternoon together as Jules read from his voluminous library while Neptune sat at his feet napping. Then, each night, Neptune jumped upon the bed, found a comfortable place, circled around it a few times, and laid down. Meanwhile, Jules checked the closet door, making sure it was fully closed and latched. Afterward, he crawled into bed next to his friend, turned off the light upon his nightstand, rolled over toward Neptune, and drifted off to sleep. This routine played out every day and night with little variation. The two friends were inseparable and lived together in constant peace and harmony. Yet one night, one fateful, awful night, everything went awry. Late that steamy summer evening, Jules was consumed with digging around in his closet for something. No one knows for certain what object he wished to find, but he apparently spent considerable time in the tiny vestiary looking and moving and moving and looking. When his search proved fruitless, he slammed the door to his closet and disgustedly crawled into bed for the evening. Looking around, he noticed that Neptune was missing from his usual nocturnal location. Neptune! Neptune! No sign of the cat. Feeling the covers, noting them to be cool, it appeared that Neptune hadn't been in that spot since morning. Come on, you silly cat. It's time to retire. No more of your hide-and-seek, Blogge, my friend. When the cat still did not jump onto the bed, Jules arose and looked all around the house, calling Neptune's name. Come on, Neptune. I am not amused, monsieur. After several minutes, Jules returned to his bedchamber, more irritated than before. Scratching his head and looking around the room, Jules mumbled a few words, cursing the cat for not appearing. He crawled into bed, pulled a sheet over him, then turned out the light with a heavy sigh. Had he thought of checking his closet, he would have found the cat, sitting at the door, waiting faithfully for Jules to open it. Poor Neptune, trusting Jules to take care of him, waited what must have felt like hours for his human to open the door so that he could take his place on the bed. When Jules did not come to free Neptune after such a long time, the cat must have begun to panic and decided to seek freedom. He bumped the door with his head. It did not budge. So the cat bumped the door again. As it was not completely latched from Jules' disgusted slam after the second nudge from Neptune, the creaky old door swung slowly open. A light sleeper, Jules was awakened by a dull thud, the first bump of Neptune's head against the closet door. Jules instantly sat up in bed. Who... who's there? Certain it was some murderous creature breaking free, he pulled the sheet up close to his chin and laid there, eyes glued to the closet, shivering with fright. The, don't, don't come out here. I, I'll hit you with... Trembling, Jules looked around, seeing nothing defensive nearby. I'll hit you with something. With the second bump, the door slowly swung open with an eerie creaking noise and the terrified Jules drew in a deep breath to scream. Neptune, in a severe panic from being stuck in the closet, leapt up onto the bed with his claws out to make certain that he didn't slip. He landed directly on Jules' leg, his claws digging through the light sheet and into Jules' skin. Thinking he had been grabbed by whatever monster lurked in his now-open closet, Jules let out his terrified scream. No! The next day, the neighbors noticed Jules absent from his daily walk with Neptune. Concerned for his well-being, one kind Samaritan contacted the constable. Upon breaking into the home, the neighbor and constable found poor Jules, dead in his bed from failure of the heart. Next to him sat Neptune, rubbing against his friend, waiting for him to awaken. Poor Jules. Poor Neptune. 
While that tale frightens me to the core, it pales in comparison to the fate of Madeleine Jambé. She too lived alone on Toulouse Street in the French Quarter of that same city, and no one was there to render assistance when her lack of attention to the rules resulted in her demise. At the age of six, Madeline learned about the rules from her sister Fiana, three years her senior. Madeline, you must learn. Learn what, Fiana? You must learn that there are rules. These rules are for your safety. At night, when the lights are off. Why at night? Because that's when it matters. That's when this city, this neighborhood, becomes something different. I know this to be true. Madeline let out an agitated sigh. Okay, Fiona, tell me these rules. Don't be like that, Fiona snapped. This is for your own good. You're old enough to know. Now pay attention. As Fiona recited the first rule, that of closing and latching the closet door, Madeline looked around the room. We don't have a closet, she sighed, rolling her eyes. I know, Fiona groaned. But someday you might, and if you do, always make sure it is closed and latched. Otherwise, the monsters that live in your closet will come out and get you. Just remember that. Okay, Madeline shrugged. What's the second rule? Rule number two is important. Fiona moved closer to Madeline's face and quieted to a whisper as she shared the second rule. Madeline's eyes widened and she backed away from her sister. Fiona, are you trying to scare me? No, young sister. I'm trying to save you. They shared the same bed, Madeline and Fiona, in a small low ceiling loft in the attic of their meager family home. In the heat of summer, the temperature and humidity in the attic space escalated to unbearable stifling proportions, like trying to sleep in a boiler room on wet sheets. The tiny window in the dormer provided little relief as New Orleans summer conditions outside were no more bearable than that of the room. Young Madeline often pulled one leg out of the covers in hopes the exposed limb might offer some cooling relief. Mind the leg, Madeline, Fiona always whispered. Remember, he's always under the bed, ready to grab it. Fiona somehow always knew when her younger sister uncovered her leg. Slowly, begrudgingly, Madeline slipped her leg back under the covers. One summer morning, when Madeline was nine, she woke up to find herself alone in bed. Normally, the sisters awakened at nearly the same time. If one awoke first, she would then reach over and touch the other so that they started their day together. Obviously, not so on this day. Looking around the room, there was no sign of her sister. Thinking Fiona simply arose early and went downstairs, Madeline rolled over to drift back to sleep until she heard her mother calling. Madeline, Fiona, come down and eat your breakfast. Madeline's eyes popped open. Did Fiona slip downstairs without mother seeing her? Madeline sat up and looked around the attic space again. Fiona's clothes and shoes from the previous day still lay in a heap on the chair across the room. She would never have gone downstairs without being properly dressed. Where could she be? Madeline jumped out of bed, looked toward the dresser, looked to the window, then stopped. Under the bed, she might be hiding from me. Madeline turned and walked slowly to Fiona's side of the bed. She looked down at her feet to make sure nothing was reaching out from underneath to grab her. It's daylight now. Nothing should grab me. Carefully examining Fiona's disheveled side of the bed, she noticed a little tear in the fitted sheet. Like the kind of tear a fingernail would make if it gripped the sheet hard. Then she saw another one. And another. Together they were arranged as if several fingers gripped the sheets hard. Really hard. 
under the bed. I gotta look under the bed. Slowly, Madeline got down on her knees by the bed. Mustering up her courage, she leaned down and grabbed the hem of the old tattered quilt under which the girls slept. Breathing hard, she laid down flat with the side of her head on the floor so that she could see underneath once she lifted the quilt. Taking a deep breath, she mustered up her courage. On three, one. Her eyes were wide open. Two. She grasped the hem. Three. Madeline yanked the old quilt up and looked under the bed. There in the middle of the floor, which she noticed was surprisingly void of dust, lay a dingy white sock. But it didn't look right. Madeline reached in and grabbed the sock to pull it toward her. Something was in it. She pulled it close to her face. The sock had a foot still in it. Fiona's foot. It took only a moment for her to scream. Years later, the year 1932 as a matter of fact, the summer once again brought unbearable heat and humidity, seemingly worse than the familiar boiler room on wet sheets feeling. Despite the extreme heat, Madeline slept every night fully covered by a sheet and light quilt, that same old tattered quilt she shared with her sister so many years before. No longer did she suffer through the nights in an attic space. She lived in a proper house on Toulouse Street, boasting two bedrooms, a kitchen, parlor, and study. Each room, gaily wallpapered and filled with light from drapeless windows, smelled of lavender and fresh flowers. Yet each evening, as the shadows grew long, the house took on an air of foreboding, which rattled Madeline to her core. During the sultry New Orleans summer nights, while the temperature in her bedroom climbed to an uncomfortable level, she never uncovered any part of her body to release some heat. All it took was remembering her poor departed sister's words. Mind the leg, Madeline. One day, in hopes of bringing about blessed relief from the stifling heat and sleepless nights, Madeline went to the appliance store a few blocks from her home. The tiny bell above the door rang joyously as she entered. Ah, Miss Jambe! The store owner clapped his hands as he walked quickly toward her. How may I help Madame today? Hello, Mr. Laban, Madeline nodded. I am shopping for a large fan as I find myself in need of relief of this stifling heat wave. Aha, my lady, come this way, please. I have some fans near the counter. Laban led Madeline to a display case where several large metal fans stood ready. Madeline folded her arms as she silently studied each unit. Three were small, with actuating arms to rotate the aim of the spinning blades, left, then right, then left again, to oscillate the airflow throughout the room. Another was a large metal box with a six-blade fan of imposing proportions inside. The fifth, largest of all, was a round fan that rested upon a heavy conical base with each of its four blades nearly 18 inches in length. How about this large round one, Mr. Laban? I like the looks of it. Laban's eyes widened. Ah, Miss Jambe. This is the new 1932 Griff model by the Zephyr Fan Company, he proclaimed, gesturing. There's much iron and strength in this unit. It is by far their best fan and moves a tremendous amount of air. Would you like to see it run? Yes, please, Madeline nodded. Laban leaned over and moved the lever switch at the base. This is a three-speed fan, madame. This is the low setting. Laban smiled as the fan spun up to its lowest speed. After a moment, Madeline scowled. I'm sure this speed would be fine for stirring the air during spring or autumn, Mr. Laban. But I believe I wish to see the higher speeds, as the heat of this summer requires something more robust. Of course, madame. I'll switch to the medium speed to see if you like it better. 
Laban moved the switch, then stood back smiling with his hands folded over his stomach as he watched Madeline's reaction to the fan. After a moment, again Madeline scowled. Please show me its highest speed. Hesitating and looking around, Laban nodded, then moved the switch to high speed. The fan instantly spun up to a new roar as papers on the nearby sales counter flew in all directions. I believe I like it at that speed, Madeline yelled above the roar of the fan. She leaned forward to point at something on the fan. Laban yelled, Madame, and grabbed her hand as he leaned over and turned off the roaring appliance. Still holding on, he patted her hand with his. Excusez-moi, Miss Jambe. Laban stumbled with his words as sweat broke out on his head. The frame around the blades of this unit, the openings, they are quite large. So large that a hand as small and delicate as yours could have easily slipped through. The blades could have cut you most terribly. It's quite all right, Madeline reassured withdrawing her hand as Laban regained his composure. I would like to buy this. Very well, madame. Laban smiled as he ran his fingers through his hair, then led her to the sales counter. It is very heavy, and I would recommend that you permit me to deliver it to your home later today. Madeline agreed. When Mr. Laban arrived with the fan, Madeline had him lug the large unit down the hall to her bedroom. I'd like to have the fan blow directly on me while I sleep, she instructed him. Laban stopped and looked at her. Miss Jambe, may I please suggest that you reconsider the orientation of the fan? You saw at the shop how forcefully it blew, scattering the papers that rested upon the sales counter. I believe you would find it most uncomfortable to be exposed to such high-velocity air as you attempt to sleep. What do you suggest? Madeline inquired. I believe you would like the performance of the fan as it faced the other way. The other way? How then would I get any benefit from the fan and the great volume of air that it displaces? Madame, a fan of this nature draws a tremendous amount of air from behind it in order to create the great wind emanating from the front. If you were to place the unit near the foot of your bed, with its discharge set to blow into the hall, it will draw the air from your opened windows through your bedroom in a most comfortable manner, then push it down the hall. The motor on this model is very powerful and will easily pull the air through the room to cool sufficiently without you having to endure the winds at the outlet. I understand, Madeline agreed. Please place it as you recommend. Laban placed the great fan about 18 inches from the foot of Madeline's bed. Satisfied, she gave him an extra gratuity for his assistance, then saw him out. That night, she prepared for bed with great excitement. Hoping to finally sleep throughout the night with relief from the heat, she turned on the huge fan, immediately switching it to the highest speed position. Turning slowly at first, the fan blades began to displace great amounts of air until the motor reached top speed. Blowing toward the door and down the hall, the gale of wind nearly slammed her bedroom door shut with great force. Luckily, Madeline saw the door begin to close and managed to grab a paperweight from her dresser to act as a doorstop. Satisfied, she crawled into bed, feeling the night air sweep across her as she pulled her covers up over her body. Mind the leg, Madeline. The roar of the great fan drowned out all other sound, and Madeline managed to fall asleep. At some point in the night, lying on her right side, Madeline awoke to something tugging at her sheet and quilt. It seemed gentle at first, just a couple of light tugs, then felt more forceful. As she gained her senses from her deep sleep, she realized that her left leg had somehow escaped from the protective cover of the sheet and quilt. Mind the leg, Madeline. At once, the old tattered quilt was forcefully pulled from the bed into Madeline's horror. She realized that something had hold of her exposed leg, pulling her to the floor. She screamed, Fiona, help me! As if her sister still slept with her in the same bed. Madeline clawed at her bedding, 
digging her fingernails into the fitted sheet. No! 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 Please leave me alone! Screaming and crying, she clawed furiously, pulling the fitted sheet loose. Unable to maintain her grip, she fell face down upon the floor, dragged further by the beast. Why have you returned for me? Was my sister not enough? She cried as she thrashed about, looking for some way to break free. She let out a great scream as she felt the jaws of the beast clamp down into her feet, severing her toes in one large bite. She gasped, screamed again, then passed out as her blood began to pool around her body. Within several minutes, a night watchman broke down her front door to gain entrance. Despite the sound of the great fan, the neighbors next door, who also slept with their windows open, heard her frightful screams and summoned the authorities. Running back to Madeline's bedroom, the officers were greeted by a gruesome sight. The great fan, positioned so close to her bed, had pulled the old tattered quilt through the blades, shooting the ragged remains into the hall. The sheet, wrapped around her leg, pulled into the fan as well, taking her leg with it. Her femur stopped the blades of the great fan from turning, which was now humming as the motor overheated. Alas, they were too late to save her as the blood loss had been too rapid, too great. As the night watchman turned off the fan to prevent a fire, the other officer looked at the ripped fitted sheet on her bed, then bent down over the deceased woman to assess the situation. Poor lady, it must have been awful to be pulled into the fan like that, the officer sighed. Yeah, this is terrible, the night watchman moaned. Judging by the rips in that sheet, she put up quite a fight. Too bad. The two men crouched in silence over the body of the woman. Her fingernails don't make sense, though, the night watchman said, looking closely at the bloody scene. What do you mean? The night watchman leaned over and lifted up Madeline's left hand. I just mean her fingernails are not very long. Certainly not long enough to put those deep scratch marks on what's left of her leg. I hope you enjoyed Mind the Leg, Madeline, as written by Tim Ritter and performed by Paul J. McSorley. On to the shows. Longtime resident Otis Jiry has his very own show here on our network, Scary Stories Told in the Dark, which you can hear every Sunday night. We also have Eric Peabody's Horror Hill, a podcast dedicated to some of our deeper and darker tales. We hope you check him out. And Drew Blood's Dark Tales airs Fridays, featuring some southern down-home horror. And don't forget to check out the Fear from the Heartland archives, featuring more than 120 episodes. Well, friends, our weekly descent into the depths has just about come to a close. But before we go, I'd like to take a moment to thank you for joining us tonight and remind you to take a moment to stop by our iTunes page and leave Chilling Tales for Dark Nights a five-star review, and a kind word. And follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram if you haven't already. And of course, subscribe to us on YouTube, where you can find an archive of our work going back to 2012. And consider signing up as a patron at our website, ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com, to show your support and get all of our content ad-free. I'm your host of the evening, Paul J. McSorley, and it's been a pleasure. Tune in again next week when we once again turn off the lights and turn on the dark. Sweet dreams, listener. Sweet dreams. <laughs>